Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Kevin Allen Schmidt. I'm on now. I'm the music director of the Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship Chalice Choir. It's our pleasure to be here. And um, thank you. <laughs> We'd like to start with an original hymn by the Reverend Andy Backus, who served this church here in Vancouver in the late 90s, and he was a polymath, and um, I know that he was a nuclear physicist and a preacher and a, a ham radio operator and a sailor, and um, he had a degree in music, and he wrote books, and <clears throat> so this is one of his most singable compositions it is a melody that has, uh, it's the perfect shape of a melody that rises and falls and, and sets, the setting of the text is just perfect. And we loved it so much that we created an adhesive copy, like on contact paper, of this. And you see that it's an exact format that the Unitarian hymn book is in, so that it looks like it was there from the start. And we have glued it into the back of our hymnals in Bellingham. So if we want to sing this Unitarian hymn, we just say, turn to the insert in the back of your hymnal. And I, I'm starting it with it because we are recognizing that the connection between Vancouver and Bellingham goes way back, and Andy back has retired to Bellingham, and then he was there for many years. He gave a gift of $100,000 to the RE program, which has allowed us to keep thriving with that before he died. When we adopted this hymn into our hymn book. It was just about two weeks before he actually died in the spring of 2020. He may have been one of the first victims of COVID, although it wasn't diagnosed at that time. So a lot to think about with this hymn. It's a beautiful poem by a Quaker preacher who was from New England around the Civil War time in the US. So let's have an introduction from Melanie and, and then we'll all sing it, all right? So good morning and welcome, whether you're with us here in person today or joining us online now or in days to come. And if you are joining us for the first time or the first time in a long time, know that we are especially delighted to have you with us this morning. As we begin, we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional and unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil As we work towards reconciliation, May we take meaningful action to help heal the wounds of our past as well as our present, that, we may, that all who call this place home may live together here in a future defined by justice, equity, and peace. And in this process of acknowledging the land, may we come to learn what it truly means to love the earth, to reverence the sacred web of life that sustains us all. So as we acknowledge the keepers of these lands, let us also acknowledge our gratitude for the earth itself on this, the first Sunday of spring, as daffodils and forsythia and azaleas blaze into a riot of color. 
So this is a special day in the life of our congregation, and we are delighted to have special guests with us. As you've already heard and seen, we are joined this morning by our friends from the Bellingham Unitarian Fellowship. Deep thanks to you all for bringing your gifts to share with us and for crossing the border to do so, apparently at a very early hour. So we are really grateful that you are here. And I am delighted to welcome to the pulpit this morning our, my colleague, Riley Yo. I met Riley and her husband, Jamie, several years ago in Toronto when I came to know them and was privileged to welcome their first child uh, when he was dedicated. So Riley is nearing the end of her journey to become a Unitarian Universalist minister with a focus on community ministry around issues of climate change. So I'm thrilled to have her with us today to share her wisdom and vision. So welcome to you and to Jamie and to Avery and to Elise. Finally, on this early spring morning, we wish a Ramadan Mubarak to all who are marking this sacred season and a happy Nauruz and Astara and Purim to all who are celebrating. As we begin, I ask that you turn off your phones and other devices, setting them in worship mode for the duration of our time together. And I now invite you to greet your neighbors and be sure to say hello to someone you've not yet met. I'll sound the chime to bring you back for the first hymn. So I invite you to rise in body and spirit as you're willing and able to sing our opening hymn by Joyce Poley called Keepers of the Earth. I understand many of you already know it. I don't. But there are four verses and we are going to sing about a river, a mountain, an ocean, and creatures. So river, mountain, ocean, creatures, I will call them out as we go through.
call us now into this time that we make sacred in our coming together with the words of Rebecca Badgett in her poem, Testimony, which she has notes that she has written for her daughters. I want to tell you that the world is still beautiful. I tell you that despite children abused on city streets, despite the slow poison seeping from old and hidden sins into our air, soil, water, despite the thinning film that encloses our aching world, despite my own terror and despair, I want you to know that spring is no small thing that the tender grasses curling like a baby's fine hairs around your fingers are a recurring miracle. I want to tell you that the river rocks shine like God, that the crisp voices of the orange and gold October leaves are laughing at death. I want to remind you to look beneath the grass, to note the fragile hieroglyphs of ant, snail, beetle. I want you to understand that you are no more and no less necessary than the brown recluse, the ruby-throated hummingbird, the humpback whale, the profligate mimosa. I want to say like Neruda that I am waiting for a great and common tenderness, that I still believe we are capable of attention, and that anyone who notices the world must want to save it. With these words, let us worship. I now invite Riley Ford to light our chalice. Together we light this chalice. Together we see its light. With kindness and in deep bonds of community, with love for the human family in all of its variety, with reverence before the world and its teeming web of life, May we care for our earthly home and for each other with courage, with love, and with justice. I now invite forward any children and any children of any age who wishes to come forward for this morning's uh, story with Kirsten. Good morning. We have a crew today. Welcome to spring. Some, some of you are on spring break. We have a story today called Trout Are Made of Trees. How can trout be made of trees? That makes no sense. Does it make no sense? Let's find out what they're talking about. Oh, there's some kids by a stream. So trout are made of trees. Yep. So this is how. In the fall, trees let go of leaves which swirl and twirl and slip into the streams. There's the leaves. And they ride in a rush above the rocks and over the rapids. And they snag on branches and other things, and they settle. They settle soggily down into the bottom of the stream there. And then bacteria feed on the leaves. Ready? So the algae grow, and it softens the surfaces. And you can see these kids are looking in the jar there to a see. Jar. Jar. Right a jar there. The, it looks like pickle juice. Yeah, it's the stream water with the bacteria in it. It looks like, it, it looks like, um... There's little bits? No, it looks like pickle juice <laughs> with dirt in it. Dirty pickle juice, which is probably not something you want to drink. Not quite yet. So, but now that the, with the softened leaves that the bacteria have softened up, the shredders move in. So we've got crane flies and caddish flies. That is, I think that, that one's like a crane snail. fly. Yep, snails and shrimp over here and stone flies, and they rip and shred the leaves, rip and snip, and they eat the algae-covered leaves. And so those algae-covered leaves become part of those insects and shrimp and snails. That looks like a, a, um, a leaf. Yeah, sometimes insects look like leaves so they can kind of hide. 
So meanwhile, there's predators are swimming and stalking. And crunch, there go the caddis flies. So the predators eat the, eat the flies and the bugs. And munch, there go the stone flies. And now the leaves that were part of the stone flies and the caddis flies become part of the predators, those little they fish. Fish. They fish like yeah, those are little um, plants. And then the trout join in. It looks like there's a crack in it. That's a, these are like rainbow trout. And they swim and they snap and the fins flick and they rush and they zap. There's a shoe. Yeah, somebody's watching. Is that a, is one of the kids are watching from the bank. And those trout eat the dragonflies. You should have, you should have. Oh my God, this is you old. Should have it's very old. One of those fish. I think, do you think these are going to, do you think one of these kids are going to catch a fish? Let's do this. I bet. <laughs> They're going to be stoneflies and the minnows. We're going we're gonna to see what happens with how the leaves become part of the trout. We can turn the book upside down so that we can read this. Story. What are they writing? They're writing about how all of these caddisflies and insects become part of the trout. There is a story in the story. And the leaves have now become part of the trout. And then the trees, that are, they also shade the streams. They keep the stream cool for spawning. And the female trout gather over the gravel and they lay the eggs. That see looks the like dirt. Let's make sure that everybody that can that see. That looks like soggy dirt. Yeah, it's a very cloudy stream, isn't it? And here come the hatchlings. There's the baby trout. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. Mm -hmm. And they grow up in a stream, crack, ker, splash, and the stream is shaped by the fallen branches of the trees. You see that? Yeah. I can read this. And so, because of that, the trout are made of trees. And so are the bears and the people who catch the trout and eat them. And I know that everything is made out of atoms. And everything is made out of atoms. <laughs> Just like the trees and us. So that is our story today. Even tiny little ants. How, if trout are made of trees, even if you don't eat trout, you eat other things that are fed by the fish. trees. Um, <laughs> And we're going to go find out if there I'm is anything else peppers. to eat leaves that we might eat. I'm allergic um, to pepper. Not like I'm um, the big pepper. Um, like the, like the, the spicy pepper? Yeah, yeah. Like Good thing to stay away from. So we're going to light our candle now, and we're going to go do some more exploring yeah, about what... Right, we're going to light our lantern from the ah. candle. So we can take... take candles. There's candles everywhere. We're going to take this flame with us. So we can light our own chalice and children's group. There we are. Oh, no, come on. There's not much wick left in there. Uh oh, Just enough, I think. Maybe not. We're going to just have to punt on this one. OK, we need a new candle. <laughs> I know. You know what? We'll have to use a match. Is there? I think that'd be a little too much. Yeah. All right. Let's go have some fun. Good morning again. My name is Karen Bartlett, and I have the privilege of serving on your board of directors. So, and a special welcome to the Bellingham Choir. I had the privilege of singing when we had the uh, choir meetups before the pandemic. It was, it was fun. Okay, so I do have a few announcements uh, for today. I'm going to take them in order. So. Over in uh, the alcove, they, we still have up the visioning board that came out of the congregational retreat that we had a couple of weeks ago. So please have a look at those. We also have sticky notes if you'd like to add um, your own thoughts or didn't have, you know, something has come to you in the interim. 
please put them up and the board will be taking that down and writing out, um, uh, collating all of the information that is on that visioning board. So we invite you to, um, uh, to do that today. And coming up, we've got on Tuesday, March 26th at 7 p.m. here, a listening circle. And that is to be able to listen to each other's concerns about, um, at the moment, the um, um, conflict in uh, the Middle East. Then on March 27th, we will be having a circle worship gathering. And that's going to be uh, Wednesday evening. And um, that would also be at 7 o'clock. Then on March 31st, uh, there's going to be a virtual meeting. And that's going to be a virtual congregational retreat for anyone who was not able to attend the in-person retreat that we had a couple of weeks ago. It's going to be in the afternoon. That's a Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4. And the link, the Zoom link for that, uh, can be found in the calendar in the web page. And we also, the board has also released a summary of lessons learned. Uh, that was from a forum from uh, February. And that has been uploaded to the member view reports also on our web page. Now, I would like to call up Leslie Hill, who has some fun things to tell us. Good morning. I'm one of the nominating committee, along with Rob Daynell, Paul Prescott, and Catherine Stewart. We're launching the search now to find three candidates to stand for members at large positions in the November AGM. If you attended the recent congregational retreat, you'll have seen that the board is a dynamic force for good here at Van U. Joining it is a wonderful way to understand the many organizational layers of this place, to make a contribution, and to live out our eight principles and the covenant of healthy relations in full. My four years um, on the board as a member at large deepened my commitment to Van U, introduced me to many wonderful people I might not have met otherwise, and enriched my, my appreciation of Unitarianism. Please ask board members about their experiences. There's a handout on the board table at Hewitt Hall today with a detailed description of the role of member at large, and it's a two-year commitment. Then let either the board member or a member of the nominating committee know that you're available. We look forward to hearing from you. We come now to take an offering to sustain the life of this congregation. If you are proud of this congregation, become its advocate. If you are concerned for its future, share its message. If its values resonate deep within you, give it a measure of your devotion. This congregation cannot endure without your faith, your confidence, and your enthusiasm. Its destiny and its hope rests, as always, in your hands. This quarter, we are sharing the offering with the First Nation Emergency Response Services Society of British Columbia which helps First Nations with wildfire and forest management. You can find more information about them and their work in your order of service. As the ushers now come forward, an offering will be gratefully received for the good work of this congregation and the wider community.
This offering is given and received as a sacred trust dedicated to the work and flourishing of this congregation and the wider community. Thank you for the many ways you give to sustain the life of this congregation. Good morning. I'm Audrey Cook, and this is uh, Roger Brandt. We take time every service to share our celebrations, our sorrows, our joys, and our concerns by lighting candles together. Some of you have made requests through the YouTube chat, through our website, or here in the sanctuary. As each candle is lit, please take a moment to hold each request in your heart and join us at the end in saying, we light these candles together. Karen and Olivia Hall request a candle for their father and grandfather, O'Opa, who died on Thursday, March 21st. We, are, we were privileged to be with him and sing to him during his last hours. David Steele requests a candle for his friend, Chen Wei, who's also Denise his friend as well, who's in hospital after a stroke. Mina requests a candle for Sahar for her speedy recovery and to celebrate that her 14-year-old brother was released by the Taliban. Yeah. Sky requests a candle for Tony, who is battling an aggressive cancer. She and her daughter need our prayers and love. Diane Brown requests a candle for the beautiful spirit of Leah Marie, beloved mother, grandmother, wife, daughter, aunt, friend, warrior for justice, flights of angels, mom, love you forever. We light the final candle for ourselves, for our unspoken joys and sorrows. Please join me in saying, we light these candles together. Enter with me now into a time of meditation, reflection, and prayer. A time we begin with words that will give way to a time of shared silence. Our reading is, It's Like This by Rosemary Watola Traumer. It's like this. The sun itself is constantly moving through space, and yet it never leaves us. Add this to the list of marvels, like how a glass of water was once a cloud, like how love can grow in us despite sorrow, fear. Given such gifts, one must wonder how it is our arms aren't constantly raised in spontaneous praise for life. I know, and you know, why sometimes our hands stay down. But now, sitting still together, even as we are spinning and racing through space, even if it's only a whisper, when faced with the truth, that great forces hold our lives in place. It feels right to say thank you, thank you, eyes lifting, heart trembling to the improbable earth so solid beneath our feet.
a little bit sad to have to uh, speak now because I would like to just sit and savor that afterglow of that incredible music. Thank you. <clears throat> so, <laughs> it feels very meaningful and very poignant to me. Now it's two weeks before I'm going to see our ministerial fellowshipping committee. Uh, they are the ones who will decide whether or not they think I'm ready to be ordained as a Unitarian Universalist minister. And now, just under two weeks before, I am back in the place where I first encountered Unitarian Universalism. So it was 2008, and my friend Julia suggested that we check out this church where diverse beliefs were not only tolerated, but encouraged and welcomed. So I happened to come to my first service right before Blue Monday, the third Monday in January, when Reverend Stephen Epperson preached a homily that I think became kind of famous in this congregation. So after he paced the aisles talking about politics in such a captivating way, a way that I certainly never expected to hear inside a church, Reverend Epperson talked about depression as a clarion call for broader cultural change. He spoke of depressed people as canaries in the coal mine of our civilization, as not deficient in some way, but instead as the carriers of deep wisdom and awareness. I was totally hooked, and I knew that I had found my spiritual home in Unitarian Universalism. And I, I first felt my small sense of call, uh, some small part of me that thought maybe I could do that too once I've acquired a lot more wisdom. So now it's 16 years later, and I'll let you be the judge of it today. So we know as Unitarians, we sometimes tend to be in our heads too much. I'm hoping you'll join me in a very simple and straightforward exercise to get us into our bodies a little bit. Totally up to you if it feels right for you or not. Um, but if you're willing, you just join your hands like this and you put them in your lap like a little polite school child. And now, without doing anything else, just switch your thumbs. You might notice that feels so awkward and so uncomfortable. I love seeing people nodding that you're, you're feeling that. If that simple act of change, which is so innocuous, feels so uncomfortable, it only makes sense that the idea of transformation can make us confused, apprehensive, maybe even a little bit afraid. Because we know transformation isn't change. I don't know about you, but I didn't transform my socks today. We don't transform the sheets on our bed. Transformation is much more profound and all-encompassing than change. <clears throat> and climate change is calling us towards transformation to transform on the cultural and social level, but also on the personal, the spiritual level. It's calling us to attend more closely to our third principle as Unitarians, encouragement to spiritual growth. And as our Time for All Ages story reminded us today, transformation is key to the health of any ecosystem. So, what kind of growth and transformation does climate change call us towards? How do we become the bearers and transmitters of wisdom in this time? How do we become not just older, but elder as we age? How are we called to be prophets and alchemists in this time of climate upheaval? So back during the Protestant Reformation, all the way back in the 16th century, 
Martin Luther and others who wanted to break from the corrupt hierarchy of the Catholic Church called for the priesthood of all believers. <clears throat> the priesthood of all believers meant that all Christians, whether they were clergy or lay people, had equal rights and responsibilities to transmit the faith. Leaders in the faith had to derive their authority from the delegation of the lay people, who were also in their own way priests of the good word of God. This had all sorts of implications for developing more democratic churches who could vote to elect their leaders versus the imposition of leadership from Rome. Now in our tradition, one of our most famous Unitarian theologians, James Luther Adams, took this further in 1947 when he called for the prophethood of all believers. The responsibility of all Unitarians to be prophetic. Now, prophecy might not be the most comfortable word for us. We might associate it with claiming a supernatural ability to see into the future, or maybe with trying to scare people with metaphysical claims about the end times. But <clears throat> you don't have to be a fortune teller to see into the future these days. We can see how the curve of our greenhouse gas emissions will climb. And while we don't know exactly what the precise impacts will be, we certainly know enough about the broad contours that we feel the urgency to act. James Luther Adams said, the prophetic liberal church is the one where people work together to interpret the signs of the times in light of their faith, to make explicit through discussion the epochal thinking that the times demand. All members share the common responsibility to attempt to foresee the consequences of human behavior with the intention of making history rather than being pushed around by it. Only through the prophetism of all believers can we together foresee doom and mend our common ways? So what then would it mean to try to make history instead of being pushed around by it? What does that call to transform into prophets really entail? First, we have to interrogate our image of the prophet as strident, focused on apocalypse, the person who goes it alone with a message of doom and disaster. <clears throat> the emerging social science around climate change communications is very clear that this doesn't work when we're thinking of the kind of one-on-one -on -one or small group interactions which are our normal opportunity to interpret and share the world together. Climate communications experts talk about how we need to thread the needle between unrealistic optimism, that it will all be okay because of technology, for example, and doomerism, the claim that it's impossible to solve climate change or it's too late to act. That's a narrative the fossil fuel industry loves and has put a lot of resources into spreading. So we need to thread the needle between too much unrealistic hope on the one hand and demobilizing fear on the other hand. Climate communications expert John Marshall, who recently completed the largest mes message testing experiment ever done on the climate debate, says that the way through this is love. To connect people to love of children and place and the future to all the things they want to save and protect from that inspired place of love and empathy. To love all those things, those mountains and rivers and creatures that call us to be keepers of the earth. We've also just got to talk about climate change more. There are many studies that show that even as more people believe in climate change and we can see the numbers rising, and people feel more deeply impacted by it, they're still not any more comfortable talking about it. I notice these days that climate change often comes up and then a joke is made and we move on. Otherwise, it's very uncomfortable to talk about. So this is the other transformation that we're being called towards, to go from being a culture where hard topics are either completely avoided or completely polarizing, 
from not talking about politics at the dinner table because it's too uncomfortable and divisive, to being a culture that can handle strong emotions and disagreement. We've got to get good at emotional alchemy, of turning that lead of hard emotions and discomfort into the gold of connection. So it is hard for our nervous systems not to get riled up when talking about something like climate change. At this point, 88% of Canadians now say we've been adversely impacted by it, and 20% say they've been extremely adversely impacted by it. We're enabled to be prophetic by these warning signs that we see in the natural world all around us, in the interdependent web that forms the basis of our seventh principle as Unitarian Universalists. We know that these changes in the natural world aren't right, and that's scary and frustrating. And nevertheless, we've got to go into these conversations. We've got to claim our prophethood from a grounded place. And if that's something you're interested in talking about more, there's still some spaces in my workshop after the service. You can join us at 1230 in the fireside room. So as I said already, we know Unitarian Universalists can often be too cerebral. A challenge for us is to get back into our bodies and remember what a source of power and wisdom they can be. Our bodies can help us with that alchemy of taking a hard emotion and turning it into vulnerability, curiosity, compassion, wisdom. <clears throat> so thank you for indulging me already in the little exercise with the hands. I'm hoping you'll indulge me in another one, which is called the physiological sigh. It's a small spiritual practice, only do it if it feels right for you, that you can just incorporate into the rhythm of your daily life to help your nervous system get more grounded. So the way it works is you inhale, I'll explain it first, then we'll do it. You inhale through your nose all the way to the top of your inhalation. When you feel like you're there, you try to sniff in a little bit extra, and then you let it out slowly through your mouth. So let's try it now. We inhale through our nose all the way in, So you do that three times, and you'll feel that parasympathetic nervous system start to kick in, that part of your body that knows how to help you stay grounded through fear and confusion. So we are being called in this time to transform into prophets, prophets who bring clarity and love, not fear. Elders and future elders who can transmit knowledge and wisdom, who can, as we're about to sing together in our closing hymn, bind the future world to the world that currently exists today. Now, we don't do any of this alone. The reason we belong to UU community is to do it together. That's what James Luther Adams had in mind, that we support each other to make history together, as you did when you supported the founding of Greenpeace, as you did when you housed one of the first same-sex wedding ceremonies in Canada, as you did when you helped welcome over 250 refugees last year, as you do in Bellingham in your partnership with the Lummi Nation. We're here to transform together as part of an ecosystem, an interdependent web of love and justice. So let's rise, embody or spirit, and sing in celebration of that interdependence. Hymn 175, we celebrate the web of life.
to protect the lives of all that share the glory of the earth, we're called to transform into prophets. To speak about the future that we know is coming, not to spark fear, but to bring clarity. To be rooted in our bodies as sources of wisdom and connection. Places where we can transform doubt, fear, and rage into conviction and purpose. To galvanize us all to take action for the sake of the people and the planet that we love. May it be so, and blessed be. So thank you all for being with us today. Thanks especially to the Bellingham Choir, to Kevin, their director, and to Riley for your prophetic... <laughs> and to Riley for your prophetic ministry among us. Though we now extinguish the flame, we carry its light forward with us. So I invite you to sing Carry the Flame. After we do so, I'm gonna ask you to take your seats for the choral benediction from both uh, from the Bellingham Choir. While the Buff Choir is coming up, I have some thanks and a poem. Thank you from the Bellingham Fellowship, Reverend Paul Beckel sends his greetings, and the RE Director, the Director of Lifelong Learning, who is my wife, Genia Allen Schmid, sends her greetings through Kirsten Moore, her friend. They have this same job. <coughs> you may notice the resemblance of Gabe Epperson, who's just turning around in the front middle and his father, Reverend Stephen Epperson there. That's a connection. Um, Gabe sings in this choir, and um, when we last sang here, Stephen was in the pulpit, and when the UCV choir came to Bellingham, we sang together at our service, and then we took part in an interfaith music festival that afternoon. Mm -hmm. So our music goes a ways back. Where Jeannie and I live on a hill in Bellingham, we can see the Coast Range Mountains right, right there, and at night we see the lights of your three ski resorts from our house. <laughs> it feels very close. We got here in less than an hour this morning. I don't know why we're not doing this more often. Um, we had a, a little trouble with COVID, but sometimes there are other troubles at the border. Here's a poem by Naomi Shibab Nye. It's about Paul Robeson who was forbidden by the State Department to leave the country during the time of McCarthy and anti-communist hysteria. It's called Cross That Line, but it's relevant to us singing for you and with you. Paul Robeson stood on the northern border of the USA. He did this concert right on the border because they wouldn't let him across, but the audience was in Canada. And sang into Canada, where a vast audience sat on folding chairs waiting to hear him. He sang into Canada. His voice left the USA when his body was not allowed to cross that line. Remind us again, brave friend, what countries may we sing into? What lines should we all be crossing? What songs travel toward us from far away to deepen our days? I'm gonna give this uh, poem to Donna, and thanks to Donna for welcoming us. Can the choir thank Donna and the UCV Choir on our behalf now. When I was in high school, the pop group Free Design came out with the song, Canada in Springtime, 1975. I've loved it ever since, and I can't come to Canada without singing it. <laughs> 